My name is Matt, welcome back to the shop, and today I want to just talk about, um, uh, it's basically an answer to a lot of comments, um, all in one big thing, which is, um, why are things in engines the way they are? So, you know, there's a lot of questions of why do we have wet sumps, or why do we have cam chains, or why do we have four valves per cylinder, or why do we have you know squish bands or why do we have this why do we have that and it shares something with darwinism so the evolution of life and this trial by fire natural selection uh, survival of the fittest thing applies to engines it actually applies to pretty much most design um design engineering of pretty much anything but you can see um, through the history of engines, a uh, a clear, very clear evolution, you know. Now, a lot of it is actually, we're lucky in a sense, because a lot of it is the physics and the efficiency, either trying to get more, you know, bang for your buck in the terms of fuel, or trying to get, you know, more power. And the majority of it is trying to make a better engine, an engine that does work for you you know what i mean uh, for the least amount of fuel for the least amount of parts for the least amount of just money and you know if you look at stuff like i don't know like the mobile phone industry or just say the tv industry or something like that one of the problems we have there is people's taste and then there's also this um reverse uh the, the reverse of supply and demand the supply drives the demand and not the other way around for instance most of us didn't ask for a lot of the features that our phone does for say you know take photographs or something you know we didn't ask for memes uh, for filters we didn't ask for god knows you know panoramic pictures stuff like that and we didn't ask for a lot of things that are on our phones that we were basically told that we need um, augmented reality. We didn't ask for that. It just became a thing. It, you know, now it, they define and tell us what we need and want, and then we kind of just follow and just say, "Oh, now I now I don't know what to do without it," kind of thing. Um, you know, so it's creating their own markets. Where with engines, yes, I know there's always going to be someone saying, "Well, there was this," but. For the vast majority of it, just say from the turn of the century, so 1900 to now, you know, so 120 years, the main drive behind the design of engines, the main evolution, has been just trying to get the most out of what we've got. One of the biggest drivers, weirdly enough, um, was aviation. You know, the aviation... Um, the drive from aviation to make a lightweight and powerful power plant was where a lot of the early development um, came in. And it was a lot of the stuff that we kind of take for granted, like um, crankshafts and conrods and stuff like that, you know, a lot of the core engine uh, components. But you can see, you know, it's, it's, it's natural selection loads and loads of ideas have come around and you know over time they die by the wayside for various reasons you know you start off early and there's all these designs atkinson cycle engines this that and the other there's all this stuff you know there was a pose piston engine so on and so forth and the engine that is the most produced and the design that has hung on the, the most is the straight four. The straight four, you know, Subaru and Porsche can, you know, deny it as much as they want and stick to their guns on the design they have. But the straight four, the inline four, is the predominant um, player in this game. And... You know, you might say, well, that, you know, that's down to cars and something from bikes and stuff. But it's not just that. There are other things, you know, like uh, the two up, two down layout of a crankshaft. Um, for many reasons, you know, for stiffness, 
yes it's not the best balance crank but for the cost for the reliability for the fact that it isn't that complicated to balance not balance it out but you can live with the imbalance that's probably one of the main ways you can you know you can state it um you know over time the spitfire engine you know one of my favorite engines of all time the merlin engine had four valves per cylinder and this was designed in 1930 you know and it's still it, it, it it's the 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 go-to today you know what i mean people tried six valves people tried five valves three valves for a long time two valves for a long time um but generally they were restrictions on the cost you know what i mean it costs that much to make this engine that they couldn't possibly just or want to add more cost you know kind of customer driven uh, also reliability driven stuff like that um design compactness casting capabilities all these kind of things um you know the evolution of these engines and I'll, you know, I argue quite frequently with guys who say stuff like, especially about the high velocity point or bigger valves are better. Some guy was yapping on about it the other day. Oh, in the 1970s they had this engine, and then when they turned in 1982, they released a new engine that had bigger valves and it lost power. But I'm like, yes, because you had shit intakes. The intake ports came you know, horizontal with the cylinder head and then did a fucking sharp 90 straight into the cylinder. If you have that design and you start fucking around with a geometry of valves, sizes, stuff like that, then you are going to get results that are a knock-on effect of having that shit design. The fact of the matter is, is you then can't say as a rule, bigger ports aren't always better. Well, you've got a failure of your design. The fact of the matter is the fundamental principle is we're trying to get air in there as quick as possible. You know, it's like this. You want to go for a run and breathe through a straw? Of course you don't. You know, if you want to get air in there fast, you want to have the least restriction to it. And if you look at engines today, the car engines, uh, just say your middle class sports car, those ports are getting more and more vertical. You know what I mean? more and more in line with what would would be the original valve angle um and you look at formula one and you look at motorbikes you know the high end of stuff even it's filtering down even into the you know the mediocre bikes and stuff the ports are basically generally starting to point further and further you know down the axis um the travel axis of the piston so you know the, the it's that evolution of we tried this we tried that and the thing is the beautiful thing is is it's one of the things that we have had loads of people loads of companies loads of people individuals companies people do racing people do this people do that all over the world in so many different applications of trying to get the you know the piston driven uh, internal combustion engine um, it's gone in every single direction. You know, you can have... It's just it's almost endless, the amount of iterations we've had of designs. Um, but it's not only that. Is we have a standard measure where we can measure uh, how these engines perform against each other. For instance, as a comparison, if you look at TVs, there are, you know, there's been different technologies for TVs. It's either cathode, uh, cathode ray tubes... It's LCD, so liquid crystal displays, or it's LED, light emitting diodes. You know, you can have all these different types of television technology, but there is no way to really compare them. You can have a pixel count, but there is no real way to compare. You know, they keep on kind of trying to come up standards for like the darkness, the saturation, the color, the amount of color numbers, but there hasn't been this one you can tell the difference between this and this. In other words, you could just look up the numbers from a 1972 engine, just like, I don't know, a Plymouth Hemi or something, as it was when it was released. Yeah, the numbers might have been fudged a bit because America were into that, but you could look at the horsepower numbers from something like that. Or you could get an old engine and run it now on a dyno and get, you know, the upgraded newer version of that engine, and you can compare them directly. You know, apples for oranges, apples for apples, pears, and what have you. However you want to define that, the fact of the matter is we can. You know, you can spit out numbers of just, say, the right planes engine, and it weighed this much, and it produced fuck-all horsepower. 
And you can see, wow, how much of a difference we've made since then, because it had a crank and it had pistons and things were similar. But you can see the evolutionary steps of through time of how these engines have changed. And you can see things that have been dropped off. You know what I mean? Um, for instance, side valves have gone by the wayside, unless you want to make an extremely cheap engine like Briggs and Stratton engines. Um, you know... You can look at all these different things. So back in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of, or 70s mainly, fucking around with port geometries. So trying to have the port offset or have a twist in it to increase turbulence to help with fuel mixing and efficiency of burn, stuff like that. Eventually, all these different types of, you know, swirls and offset ports and this, that, and the other, and we want to do this and we want to do that and... You know, they all thought they had a different, a better version of doing it. Bathtub and wedge-shaped combustion chambers, all this, that, and the other. They've all been gone by the wayside. You know, they're just, that's it. Just fucked off. The pent roof, four valve, two intake, two exhaust, larger intakes than exhausts. Straight intake runners don't really care about the exhaust too much. Um, you know, plain bearing, shell bearing. Uh, inline four engine, you know, it's it's the you know it's like the ways you could design and develop a piston. Nearly every single piston now looks pretty much exactly the same. There are slight differences, and it's the same with materials as well. You know, I mean, the majority, the vast majority of engines nowadays are built with um, aluminium blocks. You know, and even then, the processing. Some people still do die uh, sand casting. But die casting, high pressure die casting has kind of become the thing. Even stuff like vacuum high pressure die casting has become the thing. Or it's becoming the thing. You know, so it's not just are we going to go pent roof or something strange or like a Genesis engine, a five valve head or something weird like that. It's not just the fundamental um, configuration of these components it's even the components themselves like the standard practice of shot peening you know stuff like that induction hardening so on and so forth cross drilling it just goes on and on and on and on and on you know and there are things that are more you know motorbike specific so from an engine point of view stuff like um the type of oil pump that we use compared to other engines um cam you know cam chains apart from ducati because they're twats but you know the cam chain drive with sprockets and the type of chain which we'll go into later um the arrangement you know using a certain type of water pump nowadays um oil slash water heat exchangers um oil coolers if you want to call them that but they're not quite the double do double duty now are now becoming the common thing these you know certain things have been knocked on the head uh, the uptake of nicosil in the uh, car engine world nicosil coatings are meh, they're a bit sporadic they hear there some manufacturers do an engine like that and then they eventually drop it um but for motorcycles jesus christ you know nicosil took off massively and pretty much permeated every corner of the motorcycle world um, you know, so there's you can see the evolution in a sense. It's why I laugh at Harley Davidson um, engines full stop because they're still rocking the old shit, you know. And don't get me wrong, you know, everyone's had a go at it. The uh, you know, the chuffing elephant, the CX500, it not only had push rods and a single camshaft in the block like a, an American V8, but it also had twisted heads. Um, to make room for the the intakes and to span it well it's more just the intake so you can get your legs around the bloody thing because it was a different orientation it's twisted it turned 90 degrees was the entire engine but you know shafts drive has been done belts and pulleys chains have been done it's one of the reasons why i love bikes it's not just riding them but from an engineering point of view it really is trying to hone the art of engines um, you know, even, even the low budget stuff, you know, it's like, a, we will probably do it, do a case study on the, um, 
Cub engine, the Honda, you know, the most mass-produced engine ever. And the changes over time, there'll be slight incremental changes, um, more from just a cost and manufacturing point of view, which is, again, a unique window because the performance side was obviously never part of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, they would like good numbers, but you get what I mean? The vast majority of the changes of that engine over the years. I'll see if I can get my hands on a really old one and a really new one and um, maybe one in the middle and just do a comparison of, you know, the progression. I'll see if I can get five or six. But regardless, that's in the never-never. Um, but yeah, it literally is Darwinism. It literally is evolution in uh, action where bad ideas get fucked off and the good ideas stick. And they could be good ideas for several reasons, not just the one. Any road, you know, again, this is just a shop chat. It's just one of these talking points. Hope that makes sense. And I'll see you in a bit. Hopefully.